You probably know people who go to the chiropractor and swear by it. A 2010 study by Matthew Davis et al. reports that about 8% of U.S. adults visit a chiropractor each year. Presumably, for this many people to be going there, they'd have to derive some benefit from it, right? Well, that's the question we'll explore in this video. What exactly do chiropractors do? The Cleveland Clinic explains, quote, A licensed chiropractor uses special instruments or their hands to manipulate joints in the body. This process is also called spinal or joint manipulation. It can help reduce pain and correct the body's alignment and overall physical function, end quote. It sounds straightforward enough, and many different medical websites describe chiropractic care in a very similar, matter-of-fact, neutral manner. When you actually take a close look at its theoretical underpinnings, however, you find that it simply doesn't deserve the respect that it's given. To really understand this point, let's begin by looking at the origins of chiropractic care. As Stephen Barrett writes on chirobase.org, quote, Chiropractic theory is rooted in the notions of Daniel David Palmer, a grocer and magnetic healer who postulated that the basic cause of disease was interference with the body's nerve supply. Approximately a hundred years ago, he concluded that a subluxated or misaligned vertebrae is the cause of 95% of all diseases. The other 5% is caused by displaced joints other than those of the vertebral column. He proclaimed that subluxations interfered with the body's expression of innate intelligence, the soul, spirit, or spark of life that controlled the healing process. He proposed to remedy the gamut of disease by manipulating or adjusting the problem areas, end quotes. This has pseudoscience written all over it. Notice first the viewing of chiropractic care as a virtual cure-all. Anytime somebody presents you with a supplement or dietary intervention or medical treatment that they claim will help with anything you're dealing with, understand that that's the first sign of a snake oil salesman. Joseph Keating at all point out that such a mindset among chiropractors is alive and well today, quote, the breadth of contemporary, uncritical speculations bearing on subluxation is captured in the 1994 boast of a chiropractic leader, Sid E. Williams. Rigor mortis is the only thing we can help, end quote. He's like, actually, maybe we can help that, and then he breaks into the morgue and starts adjusting the corpses. Also notice the supernatural language used by Palmer. Innate intelligence, soul, spirit, spark of life. This is not the kind of language you typically hear from serious medical professionals. Chiropractic treatment also has a miraculous origin story, reminiscent of Joseph Smith founding Mormonism. Palmer claimed that he initially received his chiropractic ideas from the other world, and Simon Singh informs us that, quote, Palmer's first chiropractic intervention supposedly cured a man who had been profoundly deaf for 17 years, end quote. I think Palmer was simply confused about what happened here. My guess is that after the visit, he sent a letter to the patient explaining what his goal was, and the deaf guy wrote back like, that's the dumbest shit I've ever heard. Palmer's like, I've cured him. You also don't have to be an expert to understand the absurdity of claiming that virtually all disease is caused by misalignments within the spine. Many diseases are caused by bacteria or viruses. Some are caused by fungal infections. Others are parasitic in nature. Some are the result of genes being underexpressed, overexpressed, or not at all expressed. Others are caused by poor dietary habits or nutritional deficits. Only by having the most embarrassing ignorance of human illness could a person seriously claim that the root cause of disease is spinal misalignment. Edzard Ernst explains that, quote, early chiropractic pamphlets hardly mention back pain or neck pain, but assert that chiropractic could address ailments such as insanity, sexual dysfunction, measles, and influenza, end quote. Really, my influenza is caused by vertebral misalignments? Do I need my spine adjusted, or do you need your head examined? J.D. Haynes points out for Skeptic Magazine that the core underlying belief of of chiropractors has been experimentally rejected. Quote, chiropractic philosophy maintains that disease or abnormal function is caused by interference with nerve transmission due to pressure, strain, or tension upon the spinal nerves due to deviation or subluxation within the vertebral column. In the first experimental study of the basis of chiropractic subluxation theory, Dr. Edmund S. Krellen, then an anatomy professor at Yale University, demonstrated that chiropractic theory was erroneous. Using dissected spines with ligaments attached and the spinal nerves exposed, 
He used a drill press to bend and twist the spine. Using an ohm meter to record any contact between wired spinal nerves and the foramenal openings, he found that vertebrae could not be displaced enough to stretch or impinge a spinal nerve unless the force was great enough to break the spine. Krellin concluded, This experimental study demonstrates conclusively that the subluxation of a vertebrae, as defined by chiropractic, the exertion of pressure on a spinal nerve which by interfering with the planned expression of innate intelligence produces pathology, does not occur." End quote. Perhaps we could forgive Palmer given that he formulated these ideas over a hundred years ago, but the sad reality is that many chiropractors today continue to believe this obvious nonsense. Modern chiropractors can be divided into two main camps, straights and mixers. Ernst explains as follows in a paper of his, quote, The straights religiously adhere to D.D. Palmer's notions of the innate intelligence and view subluxation as the sole cause and manipulation as the sole cure of all human disease. They do not mix any non-chiropractic techniques into their therapeutic repertoire, dismiss physical examination beyond searching for subluxations, and think medical diagnosis is irrelevant for chiropractic. The mixers are somewhat more open to science and conventional medicine, use treatments other than spinal manipulation, and tend to see chiropractors as back pain specialists. Father and son Palmer warned that the mixers were polluting and diluting the sacred teachings of chiropractic. Many chiropractors agreed that the mixers were bringing discredit to the chiropractic. The straights are now in the minority, but nevertheless exert an important influence." End quote. What percent of chiropractors still hold to these original teachings? The stat I could find on this question are very alarming. Keating et al. report the following, quote, a 1994 sample of Canadian chiropractors was intriguing. 68% agreed with the notion that most diseases are caused by spinal misalignment, end quote. Although the statistic is about 25 years old, let's not beat around the bush here. If you visit a chiropractor, there's a good chance you're talking to a flat-out ignoramus. Also noteworthy is the high rate of vaccine denialism among chiropractors. As Ernst continues, quote, a U.S. survey was aimed at identifying chiropractors' attitudes toward immunization. A random sample, 1% of all U.S. chiropractors, was provided with a choice of policy statements. One-third of the sample agreed with the statements that there is no scientific proof that immunization prevents disease, that it causes more disease than it prevents, and that contracting an infectious disease is safer than immunization." End quote. Look on the bright side, though. If you take your chiropractor's advice and you end up with measles, at least he claims that he can cure you of it. Now let's be clear, I'm not saying we should go around calling people morons for going to the chiropractor. We should call them retards instead, it's a much more insulting term. No, plenty of people do go to the chiropractor and they claim to feel much better afterwards. You can even watch videos on YouTube of people receiving chiropractic adjustments and telling us that it really improved their symptoms. Look, if you feel that it's helpful, I'm not going to try to physically restrain you from going there. But I would encourage you to consider a few things. One is the possibility that the relief you feel is coming from the placebo effect. It's well established that if you give people sugar pills or sham treatments of one kind or another, many of them will report an improvement in their condition in large part because they expect the treatment to have an effect. If you're going into your chiropractor visit expecting to receive legitimate medical care and expecting to feel better afterwards, for some percent of us, this belief alone could be what's making you feel better. And it's not necessarily just the belief that's doing this. The act of sitting down with a chiropractor and talking about your health problems with the person who genuinely cares about your well-being could also help make you feel better. On top of that, chiropractors take a notoriously hands-on approach, and it's well known that such physical contact triggers the release of various hormones that could also make you feel better. And they're not just touching you, but they're cracking your spine in all kinds of different ways. The unusual sensations you'd feel as a result of this are going to add an additional element of excitement and pain-reducing adrenaline to the procedure. Also consider that if you go there for some sort of pain you're experiencing and report feeling better the next day, maybe the pain would have gone away on its own regardless of the treatment you received. Did the chiropractor help to alleviate the pain, or is this a regression to the mean that you're mistakenly giving him credit for? The presence of these many confounding variables is why personal anecdotes alone aren't good enough and why clinical trials are needed to determine what's actually causing the reported improvements. 
What about the YouTube videos of chiropractic care? The first thing you'll notice is that there are a lot of these, and millions of people watch these videos. Spinal subluxation gets destroyed by chiropractor, 2.6 million views. Back pain wrecked compilation, number 19, 20 trillion views. Then I post a super detailed video thoroughly explaining why this is bullshit, and like 800 people watch it. You know what, fuck this shit, I'm just gonna start posting chiropractor videos instead. All right, Mr. Daniels, let's go ahead and adjust that neck here. Oh, I fucking killed him. Regarding the many videos of people being adjusted, filming the procedure only adds further confounding layers on top of everything else I mentioned. Here's just one example of many where we get real-time feedback on how the patient feels afterwards. Exactly, how do you feel? Yeah, I don't, I don't feel the tension right here. You don't feel the tension? I like the thing. So a little bit different than before, mm -hmm. when you first came in, yeah. right? Good, good. Video testimonies like this are just not at all convincing to me. On top of the other factors mentioned, the act of being filmed itself is going to spike a lot of people's adrenaline because many of us are nervous on camera, especially when the YouTube channel you're going to be on has over a million subscribers like this one. Plus, there's a strong social pressure here to sort of go along with what's expected. A normal, polite person wouldn't want to hurt this very nice chiropractor's feelings by saying, no, I don't feel any difference whatsoever. This didn't help me out one bit, and this was a complete waste of my time. Then there's the added pressure to give the audience what they want by assenting to these leading questions, the expected and hoped for answers to which are very obvious. Even if you did have the rare person who flatly said on camera, this did nothing for me, it's their YouTube channel, so they could simply decide not to upload such a video. If an online seller on Amazon, for example, could personally decide which reviews to approve, my guess is they would only make public the four or five star reviews so as to make their product look better. And let's say the patient genuinely did feel better immediately after the procedure. It's quite possible that the effects would be very short-lived, and once he drives home in the excitement wears off, he might feel exactly how he did beforehand. So since personal anecdotes aren't reliable, let's then turn now to the scientific studies on the question. There's actually been a lot of research done on chiropractic care, so we're going to do our best to reach an overall conclusion on the question by looking at systematic reviews of systematic reviews. In a 2005 publication, Ernst and Cantor write the following, quote, Literature searches were carried out in four electronic databases for all systematic reviews of the effectiveness of spinal manipulation in any indication, published between 2000 and May 2005. 16 papers were included relating to the following conditions, back pain, neck pain, lower back pain and neck pain, headache, non-spinal pain, primary and secondary dysmenorrhea, or in other words, menstrual cramps. You don't even want to know what tertiary dysmenorrhea is. Infantile colic, asthma, allergy, cervicogenic dizziness, and any medical problem. The conclusions of these reviews were largely negative, except for back pain where spinal manipulation was considered superior to sham manipulation, but not better than conventional treatments. Collectively, these data do not demonstrate that spinal manipulation is an effective intervention for any condition. Given the possibility of adverse effects, this review does not suggest that spinal manipulation is a recommendable treatment." End quote. In 2011, they published an updated version which included additional reviews done since their first paper. Quote, Electronic literature searches were conducted to identify all systematic reviews of spinal manipulation for any indication published between May 2005 and January 2011. 45 reviews met the inclusion criteria. The conclusions drawn from most reviews were frequently cautious or negative. For instance, for low back pain, three reviews arrived at positive conclusions, one arrived at equivocal conclusions, and three arrived at negative conclusions. For asthma, three reviews arrived at negative conclusions, and one arrived at equivocal conclusions. For headaches, two reached positive conclusions, whereas three reached negative conclusions. Thus, there was an undeniable degree of contradiction between these reviews. 29 reviews have been published since our previous assessments. Nine of those suggested that spinal manipulation is effective, and 20 failed to do so. Therefore, most of these reviews failed to produce convincing evidence to suggest that spinal manipulation is of therapeutic value." End quotes. In their first paper, they also point out that the positive conclusions reached in many of these reviews could very well be the result of researcher bias. Quote, it is perhaps relevant to note that all three of the overtly positive recommendations for spinal manipulation in the indications 
back pain, neck pain, and headache originate from the same chiropractor, end quotes. And here they appear to be talking about Gert Bronfers, a so-called doctor of chiropractic who works at the Integrative Health and Wellbeing Research Program, as well as the Center for Spirituality and Healing. This guy sounds like the real deal. Spinal manipulation, spirituality, why not bust out the fucking tarot cards while we're at it? He's like way ahead of you, brother. Got him right here. I'm sorry, but if I'm given advice by the Center for Spirituality and Healing, I'm probably going to do the opposite of what they tell me. And it's not just this one individual researcher that's a source of bias. We're told in another paper that this appears to be a field-wide trend. Quote, We have systematically assessed a representative sample of recent reviews on this topic. Each review was evaluated for methodological quality. There were statistically significant pairwise correlations between each of the three factors. Direction of conclusion, methodological quality, and author authorship by osteopaths or chiropractors. This indicates an association between authorship by osteopaths or chiropractors and low methodological quality and positive conclusion. We conclude that the outcomes of reviews of the subject are strongly influenced by both scientific rigor and profession of authors. The effectiveness of spinal manipulation for back pain is less certain than many reviews suggest. Most high-quality reviews reach negative conclusions, end quote. They quantify this bias in their most recent review, quote, 7 of the 18 reviews, 38%, published either by chiropractors or osteopaths, arrived at overtly positive conclusions, and 11, 62%, arrived at negative or equivocal conclusions. 24 of the 27 reviews, 88%, by independent research groups reached negative or equivocal conclusions. Only 3, 12%, arrived at positive conclusions, end quote. So 12% of reviews by independent researchers had positive conclusions versus 38% of those by chiropractors or osteopaths. I'm reminded of that quote by Upton Sinclair, where he said, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Of course the chiropractor is going to be more likely to conclude that chiropractic care is effective. His entire life is organized around that very idea. I wouldn't exactly call them the most impartial researchers. What's he going to do? Say, yeah, it's bullshit, now time to get right back to it? Very unlikely. Now, does this mean that any time a study supports chiropractic care, we should just automatically reject it as biased? No, of course not. But the presence of such a bias does mean that we should be extra skeptical of such studies and take any positive conclusions in this area with a grain of salt. Probably the most devastating argument against chiropractic care is the complete lack of consistency among diagnoses and proposed interventions. Stephen Barrett on quackwatch.org details a number of undercover investigations of chiropractors where their embarrassing incongruence was made absolutely plain. Quote, During the 1970s, I supervised a study in which a young woman took her healthy four-year-old daughter to five chiropractors for a checkup. The first said the child's shoulder blades were out of place and found pinched nerves to her stomach and gallbladder. The second said that the child's pelvis was twisted. The third said one hip was elevated. The fourth predicted bad periods in rough childbirth if her shorter left leg was not treated. He was also like, if you don't get this fixed now, your daughter's gonna grow up to be a whore. No, that part I made up. The fifth not only found hip and neck problems, but also adjusted them without bothering to ask permission, end quote. Not only are their diagnoses wildly inconsistent, but sometimes they flatly contradict each other. As Barrett continues, quote, Brown also reported that one chiropractor told him his left leg was shorter than his right, and another chiropractor told him just the opposite. During 1989, William M. London visited 23 chiropractors in Ohio and Florida. Three identified subluxations at differing locations, three said his left leg was shorter than his right leg, and two said his right leg was shorter than his left, end quote. By the way, this correcting of allegedly uneven legs is one of the oldest con man tricks in the book. James Randi and the Faith Healers describes how pastors and televangelists will astonish their credulous audiences by claiming to correct discrepant leg lengths using nothing but the power of Christ. How is this trick done? Quote, As the subject sits, Grant merely places his hand beneath the feet, twisting his hand so that one shoe is pulled slightly off the foot, and the other shoe is pressed tightly against the sole. By Reversing the twist, the farther shoe is pushed on against that sole, and the two shoes, as well as the two feet, are now seen to be the same length. End quote. Here we see chiropractor Greg Johnson assess his patient's leg length at the beginning of their exam, and he tells us that the left leg is about a half inch shorter than the right. Yeah, 
his left leg short by about half inch. After performing a few adjustments, he takes another look and claims that the legs are now even. Legs are now even. It's a miracle that anyone actually falls for this shit. I had a chiropractor try this on me one time and I was like, fuck you, dude. He was like, ah, looks like your left middle finger is longer than the right one. I can fix that right up. For the low, low fee of $999, of course. <laughs> Perhaps it actually is the case that certain people's legs are uneven and that chiropractors correct this. All they claim to be doing, after all, is making biomechanical adjustments, so their assertions are much more plausible than those of the sweaty pastor who's ranting about Jesus. And since I'm not there to physically measure the legs in every such demonstration, I can't say with certainty that all chiropractors who do this are deceiving others or perhaps even deceiving themselves. But if they're actually measuring and correcting something real, why would different chiropractors contradict each other and disagree about which leg is longer than the other. Dr. Johnson, at another point in this video, breathlessly explains what it is that he's doing and what impact he claims that it has on the body. So I adjust all the joints of the body so I can get cavitation of all the synovial joints. It seems a neurological proprioceptive bombardment in the cerebellum, which it then regurgitates and sends out efferent information to the rest of your body's kinesthetic movements. Either that was the most brilliant thing I've ever heard, or this guy has no idea what he's talking about. At first, I was really confused, like, why is this guy talking so fast? But then it hit me. He's probably got a bunch of FedEx deliveries waiting in his van outside. Also noteworthy are some of the absurd rituals that these chiropractors engage in. As J.D. Haynes writes, quote, Chiropractors also differ about how to find subluxations and where they are located. In addition to seeing them on x-ray films, chiropractors say they can find them by feeling the spine with their hand, measuring skin temperature near the spine with an instrument, concluding that one of the patient's legs is functionally longer than the other, studying the shadows produced by a device that projects a beam of light onto the patient's back, weighing the patient on special scales, and or detecting nerve irritation with the device, end quote. More from Barrett, quote, another chiropractor was noted to diagnose patients by passing a cylindrical instrument over the patient's back and marking any spots over which the instrument makes a squeaking noise. Another examined patient's eyes for markings he claimed would indicate what diseases were found within the body, a practice called iridology. Another told the reporter his ears were acting as antenna for nerve energy that had become congested in his diaphragm. One chiropractor placed a potato and an egg on the reporter's chest to test the strength of his arms, held a magnet over his thymus glands, concluded that nutrient deficiencies were present, and sold him four bottles of glandular substances for $47.50, end quote. I don't know about you guys, but whenever my doctor pulls out the potatoes and magnets, a wave of relief just washes over me. Chiropractors sure do love to use a variety of tools and gadgets to assist them. Maybe they'll tap your arm with this stick thing. Maybe they'll bust out the hammer and peg to adjust a gigantic bodybuilder. Talk about getting chiseled, by the way. Maybe they'll use the egg beater thing, or the vibrating sander thing, or the massage gun. You really never know what to expect from them. Apparently, there are even chiropractors who will give your horse an adjustment. Yes, when his back is hurting from carrying your fat ass around all day, why not head on down to the Options for Animals College of Animal Chiropractic? This is a real place that real people go to spend their money at. A lot of this stuff is pretty ridiculous and it's fun to laugh at these people, but we also need to stop to consider the harm that chiropractors cause. One is simply wasting people's time and money. Time spent getting your back adjusted and getting potatoes put on your chest is time that could be spent visiting a specialist that could actually help you with your medical problems. Now, of course, it's not like these things are mutually exclusive. You could visit a chiropractor and see a traditional doctor as well. But what about the people who forego conventional treatment and opt for the chiropractor? instead. Some merely add the chiropractor visits into their standard medical care, whereas for others, it gets in the way of medical care. The billions spent each year on chiropractors could simply be put to better use. I'm not naive enough to argue that in the absence of chiropractors, every dollar that would have been spent on them would instead be donated to medical charities and organizations working towards curing and reducing diseases. Still though, almost anything you do with your money would be more productive than giving it to these people. May I I recommend supporting my video creation on Patreon. Many who visit the chiropractor will also experience unpleasant side effects and occasionally walk away injured or even killed. 
Well, it's not like they walk away killed, but you get the idea. Harriet Hall points out the following for the Skeptical Inquirer, quote, spinal manipulation is not entirely harmless. Patients may not voluntarily report adverse effects to the chiropractor, but meticulous studies have shown that in at least a third of patients, side effects occur, including pain, tiredness, or headache. These effects are usually mild and short-lasting, but in one study, 14% of patients reported that their ability to work was impaired. Serious consequences such as broken bones, vascular and spinal cord injuries, and ruptured discs have been reported, but admittedly these are rare and are more common with neck manipulation than with lower back manipulation." End quote. Here's an example of one of those rare but real instances where a chiropractic adjustment turned out to be deadly, as described by J.D. Haynes, quote, When Christy Bedenval wanted relief from a bad sinus headache, the 24-year-old former beauty queen and medical office administrator made the mistake of consulting a chiropractor. An autopsy performed Formed on Christy revealed that the manipulation of her neck had split the inner walls of both vertebral arteries, resulting in a fatal stroke. The chiropractor's violent twisting of her neck caused the torn arterial walls to balloon and block the blood supply to the posterior portion of her brain. Studies confirmed that the blood clots formed on the two days she received her neck adjustments." End quotes. And if you just watch what chiropractors do during their adjustments, the only thing I find surprising is that serious injuries don't occur more often. Look at some of the violent twisting contortions that they subject people to. This is exactly what I would do if I was trying to break this guy's neck. There was a comment on this video that said, I cracked my wife's neck. She is so relaxed, she's still sleeping after four days. There was another one that said, when I stretch your upper trap, does that make you feel like your upper trap is being stretched? Why, yes it does. Where's my money? And it's not just random people who go to the chiropractor either. Many professional athletes and fighters go there as well. You can even go to YouTube and watch UFC fighter Cody Garbrandt getting his neck adjusted. If I was his chiropractor, I'd fuck his neck up and then bet on his opponent. Now, I do need to reiterate that not all chiropractors are the same. Some cling tenaciously and dogmatically to the original pseudoscientific teachings of D.D. Palmer, whereas others blend their chiropractic adjustments with reasonable, evidence-based insights from physical therapy and traditional medicine. Still, though, is this the best way to go about it, or are they merely diluting the pseudoscience? So what are the key conclusions we can reach here? The theoretical foundation of chiropractic care is complete nonsense, and there is no reason to believe that most human disease is caused by spinal misalignments. Chiropractic semi-religious origin story gives us further reason to be skeptical, and the supernatural language used in this field has no place in modern medicine. Personal testimonies of chiropractic's effectiveness could be caused by many confounding variables, and the scientific research on this question overall doesn't show it to be very promising. Many studies on this question are also biased by the fact that those seeking to investigate its effectiveness already strongly believe in its effectiveness. When tested, different chiropractors come up with wildly inconsistent and sometimes contradictory diagnoses, and some of the tools and gadgets that they use are completely laughable. Real-world consequences of chiropractic care include wasted time, wasted money, injury, and sometimes even death. Stop wasting money at your chiropractor and instead waste it supporting me on Patreon. Patreon.com slash a skeptical human. Patrons receive access to bonus videos, get their questions answered in AMAs, and are eligible to win my monthly book raffle. If you're anything like me, you're subscribed to a huge number of YouTube channels. This means that any one channel's videos are rarely shown to you on your homepage. Don't leave it up to chance or the algorithm. Make sure you know when I'm posting stuff by clicking the bell to get notified. Finally, if you want to help grow my channel, don't just selfishly enjoy my content. Consider sharing it with others on social media. Thank you all for watching and listening, as always, and until next time, take care.